Hello, podcast listeners. I'm Barbara Morgan, and you're listening to Austin Film Festival's On Story podcast. This week on On Story, we're taking a look back at Robert Downey Sr.'s 1972 cult classic, Greaser's Palace, with legendary filmmakers Paul Thomas Anderson and the late Jonathan Demme. In 1972, following a succession of truly unruly underground films, including 1968's Putney Swope, Robert Downey Sr. gave the world a new take on the holy story of Jesus Christ in the form of the acid western Greaser's Palace. Featuring a brilliant mix of offbeat character actors and willing amateurs, Downey weaves a New Testament allegory against the backdrop of an absurdist western parody. Paul Thomas Anderson, director of 2021's Licorice Pizza, and the Silence of the Lamb director Jonathan Demme joined to pay tribute to Robert Downey Sr.'s cult classic after a retrospective screening at the Austin Film Festival. Clips of Greaser's Palace, courtesy of Greaser's Palace Company. Why did you choose this of all of his films, Jonathan? Um, well, the... Uh I mean, the, the, I was given the wonderful invitation to screen some movies that um, mean a lot to me. And um, I, I thought of Greaser's Palace, I really thought of Austin in a way. And I just feel like Greaser's Palace, you know, is, is a very kind of Austin kind of film. And it's rarely seen. Uh, it's pretty obscure. Most people don't even know about it. And I love this film. And I was actually hoping, well, we're up here having this dialogue that... Paul might be able to help me seriously understand why I love this film so much. Um, but I just sucked, uh, I just really thought it was a great opportunity to, to share it for those who dare. <laughs> you talked the other day about needing a thematic element to tie your movies to and not just relying on story and that you like to have a theme. Um, you care to make a guess what the theme is with this movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I'll tell you what, though. You know, yeah, well, we, we can see that it is this kind of Jesus allegory and what have you. But, you know, I've, I've seen the film a number of times over the years, and I still, it's impossible to trace it. I mean, what's he doing out of Hervé Villachez's place with Petunia, for example? What do you want here? I'm hungry. Come in here. Spitunia! 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 Petunia, how about some grub? Everybody's famished. Where does this fit into the Jesus narrative? Um, so, I, <laughs> but there's that theme, and and in a in a sort of essentially narrative list film, uh, a, a story list film, really kind of, um, it's a flow of of moments and, and images and stuff. You know, there's this theme, and that's what we I guess what we latch onto. You know, trying to figure it out. The uh... Paul, you said in an interview once, it's a gamble you take, the risk of alienating an audience, but there's a theory, sometimes it's better to confuse them for five minutes than let them get ahead of you for 10 seconds. And I wonder if Bob influences you in, in that way at all and, and what inspires you. I think you. I stole that from him. He That's said right. that. Yeah. I, um, well, Bob doesn't seem to be that worried about what, you know, confusing the audience. Um, <laughs> But that's okay, and that's and that's why it's great, you know. Um, not that he's not that he's not delivering, you know. He just has his own rhythm, and part of I think what excites other filmmakers the most about him is just this incredible confidence and this sort of balls that it takes to just commit to what his rhythm is, and his rhythm of telling a story is not <laughs> what you're used to. There's no, it's not going to be anything like. You know, and he just, he, he's intractable about that. He's not aggressive about it, and it's actually not, I mean, I know him pretty well by now, and it's nothing, he's, he doesn't wave this big flag about trying to be different or anything. He just cannot help but kind of follow his own rhythm of his life and his work. So it's not, 
he doesn't, is not like, there's no ten, Bob's 10 rules of how you're supposed to do anything. He just has instinctual feelings that he follows and he sticks to them and they make him laugh. They engage him, you know, and, and, and that's kind of it. And so as, as another filmmaker, seeing that is like, it's invigorating and it reminds you like to have that confidence, to have that trust in, your, in yourself. And yes, you should give over, to, you're making a, a, something for an audience, but that enjoyment that, that I see, I, I see him enjoying himself in the work that he puts out there so much. And that's, that's really intoxicating and thrilling. And, you know, you know, I wish I had more of the guts to kind of do, do these, these sorts of things. He made a film called Moment to Moment, which is even really abstract. And it's kind of like the most beautiful home movie. And everybody's seen it. You know, there's a Criterion, um, an Eclipse Edition DVD box set out now of all of his early work. So go find that. It's so... If this is the first movie of his that you've seen, you, you know you can you can go look at this other stuff and see that there's there is a kind of pattern to the way that he does things, and that you either get with or you don't. But man, I'm like you know smitten with it. So and you can see a lot of those the extra commentary where you're interviewing him. It looks like in his office. Um, you can see those on YouTube. Oh actually. my God! Right? Yeah, yeah we so did that. Haven't seen yeah, that, that's a really cool thing to check out. Do you think it's a response to El Topo, which is an well, earlier movie? Um, it, it's certainly rooted in that moment in time. I, I think there is a, 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 a response. I'm, I'm sure Bob saw El Topo at the Elgin Theater in Manhattan. Now, you may know that that's you know, not true, but, but this was a moment when he made this where you could do anything. You know, El Topo pushed the, the, the um, envelope on violence and bloody violence you know, all the way. And uh, this was a moment in time when you could do anything. You could, you know, there was no limitations on, on uh, he certainly every word in the sexual vocabulary appears in this film. Um, so I, I think that, that Bob was capitalizing on that openness, but I'm not sure if, if maybe, um, I mean, chafed elbows, do, do we, we know how you get chafed elbows, right? From f***ing on the carpet. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> How, how did Bob Donnie influence you guys as filmmakers, Cliff? Well, a lot like what I said before, just seeing somebody who's so committed to what their own, you know, humor is, and that 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 you see that, and you think, well, that that's what you should be doing. You should really, you know, how whatever you feel about things, do it because that is Bob. I mean, if you hang around with Bob to get to know Bob, it's there's the, the, you can understand. Okay, that's the films he makes. He makes these films. He's he's got the most gr the fantastic perverted sense of humor, and and he's got a lot on his mind. You know, from you know politics to baseball to sex to everything. He's got a lot on his mind, and and then he he finds these ways to make these things come out and. You know, when I saw um, Putney Swope was the first thing that I saw. And, you know, I saw it because the poster for the movie was something I'd never seen. It was like a, the fist and the middle finger was the girl, this sexy girl. And that, that, that alone was something that I'd never seen before, let alone putting the movie in and seeing this kind of insanity that I thought, oh, my God, that's, a, that's just it's thrilling, you know? Um, I think that, well, for me... Just thinking out loud, and I, there's a you know, I, was, I think there's a lot of filmmakers here in the room, and we all um, have that. We 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 all understand that something that can really be great when you're when you're presenting your film is that you're really proud of if you have these sort of like extended takes. You know, we we love it when we can make an extended take work, and. Um, uh, because there's great power in extended takes. It's, uh, you know, I think part of the bottom line on that is that, you know, every time you cut, you, you know, you suspend the reality that you've just been building up with the shot you were in, so now you're going to cut. So isn't it great when we can kind of stay in the same shot? And of course, in Greece's Palace, Downey takes, you know, the sustained take to extraordinary extremes, capitalizing on, on both the power of it and, and finding the humor in it. You know, we've all seen that shot when, when all the badasses come out and go into the street and for, to, for, to confront whoever that's out there. Um, but we're used to it cutting to, to whoever they're going to see. And Downey just holds and holds and holds and holds and holds and holds. And you start worrying about the cameraman. You know, he's got this ferocious handheld frame. He's going backwards and, and on and on and on. And then it cuts like briefly. 
You see Lemmy Homer briefly way in the background, and now it cuts to the long lens, and here they come again. And it's both great cinema to me, and it's hilarious. And um, uh, so I think that kind of like, like I, I saw Greaser's Palace, um, I guess a year before I directed my first little movie, which has nothing of the cinema in Greaser's Palace, but I know that, that uh, and I, it's funny too, because I, I, I met Bernardo Bertolucci in Los Angeles just shortly before um, making my first film. And uh, uh, the, the first question he asked me when I was introduced by a mutual friend, he said, oh, are you going to use a lot of long takes? And I was like, <gasps> you know, I realized how terrifying that is. It's, it's frightening to, to kind of put your production day money on, ex- on something that we're going to we're gonna put all our energy into this long take and we're going to make this work because the, the sun's going across the sky and you know, it, better, it better work. So um, I think that kind of like double whammy made me um, really kind of aspire to long takes. And uh, I've never seen them used more effectively. The other thing I think is great about this, and I think probably had some kind of influences, is like, you know, Downey dares to, um, he operates on the premise that um, something that's really going to be really, really funny or really impactive, um, you may have to let it gel for a while. So here's the guy that's saved to a degree, and, and he says, I can crawl again. And that's funny, but then he keeps playing it, and he keeps playing it. And even as the sun goes down, you're hearing it. It goes from being something that was like, like lasts too long to something that's kind of exquisite because he like dared to go all the way with it. So I just think that's a great challenge for, for all of us. But I was just thinking about some of the filmmaking stuff that Jonathan was talking about, um, which... He's right, you know, sometimes <clears throat> just seeing the guys get, trying to get on the horse. <laughs> and that's just like classic Bob Downey, too, because, uh, well, it, it really looks like they're falling off. It doesn't, really look, it doesn't really look like they're trying to push it too much. And there's a real gracefulness about it because there's the, the, there's the closer shot where it is one shot, and then they cut to the wider one, or the long lens one. And it doesn't, that's actually one that goes on a little bit long, but there's no, there's no extra f- crazy foley or bumps or anything else. It's all very kind of silent and, we, and, and little shush, shush and things, little sounds like this that make it even funnier. That's kind of a classic Bob staple. You know, I think he did all the sound later on all these movies. I mean, it sure sounds like you hear it. And definitely I know Putney Swope. And that's, and he seemed to kind of like, there's some things with sound that he did that were great and, and kind of humorous in their own way, you know, where you hear things or don't hear things. And they had a kind of a music to it. He has a kind of a jazz obsession, Bob Downey, and he always talks about his movies a little bit like jazz, you know, tries to put them in those terms. Mm. And you can see that just in, in, in how indulgent he can be in following something for a little bit longer than you should if you're trying to move a story along. <laughs> but that's, that's what makes them unique. That's what makes them these beautiful movies and these kind of combinations of things that Jonathan's reminding, you know, these, like, he'll go from using, like, a fisheye lens or practically a fisheye lens, probably like a 10-millimeter lens, a like really wide thing to something really long lens compressed thing. And those combinations of things which I just sort of take for granted now, because I remember when I saw them the first time, was I just spent so long trying to get those combination of things to work, or I'm like, oh my God, how do he puts those two things together and he gets this great result. Um, that, you know, when you, when you reappreciate them, you start talking about them, you remember like, he's doing things that were like nuts to do that you'd never seen before. And but why do you think he's gone, you know, relatively underappreciated and with the, you know, larger movie going populace of, I mean, just because it's so absurd. More and more people come along, and yeah. you know, just just uh, he he hasn't made that many movies lately, and more and more exciting filmmakers come along, uh, and uh, you know, we we go to their films and stuff. But that's you know, it's a, the kind of the fickle nature, I guess, of the way that works. But um, I mean, clearly, look, you know, we're, we're all here. I, every filmmaker wants an audience, but Bob certainly has never kind of decided to take his genius and say this time. This time, maybe just for once, I'm going to make a very straightforward picture and harness all my gifts on something in pursuit of a big audience. I mean, we got, you know, the most original filmmaker in the country sitting here. Paul really wants his pictures to be seen. Bob's 
kind of a little bit different in that regard. He's, he's, he's like making it to make it, kind of. I, I mean, he's like a poet, and I like that jazz thing a lot. He'd love to have an audience, but he's not gonna, he's not gonna work to get it, and therefore, He's a little marginal. But I wanted to ask you, because you've seen, I think, the earlier pictures much more recently than I have. I saw them as they came out a million years ago, his early pictures. And isn't Greaser's like a lot more cinematic than, than any of the early ones? Yeah, but probably more cinematic just because it looks like they're outside of like New York City, you know, where all of his stuff before was. And you felt like you were in apartments and streets and found locations, but it's not as if suddenly he got a budget and went out to the desert and, and wildly changed his filmmaking style. It was like he just transplanted his style from his friend's bedrooms in the streets of New York to the middle of New Mexico in a fun, and had a set built and things like that. And that's what's so cool is that it, didn't, it wasn't like suddenly here's this cash and I'm completely changing my style or venue. It's sort of like, it's like no... You know, you can just see Bob with his New York accent in the middle of New Mexico with these cowboys like, oh, put the camera over here. The way he talks, you know, is very New York. Is it more cinematic? Maybe a bit more because it's open spaces and things like that. But it's still the same ridiculousness and insanity, which is so, we, the content wise, it's so um, him that it, it's funny. That's the, and that's what makes this pretty neat. And also weird characters. I mean, he's pretty known for grabbing non-actors. I think he said he one actor he got from a movie he ran into in a phone booth on Bleecker Street. Like, he, he has a great eye for those specific types of bizarre characters. Yeah. Petunia was a guy who's in Putney Swope and Moment to Moment. I can't, I'm blanking on his name, but he was a lawyer that he knew and... You should see moment to moment. He's moment to moment. He's got a sequence where he walks in. Petunia, I can't remember his name. Walks in in this twenty-gallon cowboy hat <laughs> and proceeds to sit down with uh, Elsie Downey, and they just start doing coke for like ten minutes and talking to each other, <laughs> and that's the scene. <laughs> Do they ever get envious or inspired by contemporary filmmakers? Uh, oh my God! To to have made a film of this originality. Uh, would be like something that would make my chest explode with proudness. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel that, that a little bit of the same way. Like, you know, you sneak off with your friends and let your, and, and be able to open, uh, open up some part of your mind or your imagination that it flows in such a way that you could just go and do something like this. Just to be that in touch with what your imagination or your sense of humor is doing and let it kind of turn into this thing that is only concerned with being that. That's like, I wish I could do that. Well, let's thank these two great filmmakers for bringing another great filmmaker here. On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. This project is supported in part by the Cultural Arts Division of the City of Austin Economic Development Department, the Texas Commission on the Arts, the U.S. Institute of Museum and Library Services, Texas Library and Archives Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts on the web at arts.gov. On Story is presented in part by Two Far Media, provocative stories for the eyes, Ears and Imagination by Rich Shapiro. Download the Too Far Media app. Support for On Story comes from Bogle Family Vineyards, sixth generation farmers and third generation winemakers, creating sustainably grown wines that are a reflection of the Bogle family values since 1968. This show is produced by myself, Barbara Morgan. Our associate producers are Jamal Knox and Colin Heyer. Our editors are Jamal Knox and Travis Neely. Music is by Brian Ramos. Production assistance comes from Sound Lab Inc., Travis Kennedy Sound, and KUT 90.5 in Austin. Go to austinfilmfestival.com to find out more about Austin Film Festival and Conference each October. Until next time, I'm Barbara Morgan, and this has been Austin Film Festival's On Story.